Let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder. And I'm delighted to see all of you here today for a very, very important topic with a superb guest. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome David Scobie. Uh, David is, uh, like myself, a former University of Michigan person. Uh, he is a wonderful scholar, a wonderful researcher, and he is also in charge of a terrific, terrific new project uh, called Bring Theory to Practice. So if you haven't seen that, just go to that link there, bttop. Uh, dot org, and you can find out more. Uh, David is an Americanist, and he is a deep, deep thinker, and for my money, one of the most creative and interesting thinkers in higher education. And he's also one who has managed to have an incredible, incredible degree of empathy. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have David uh, here on the program. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, David, welcome. Well, I'm really, really glad uh, that you could make it, David. Uh, uh, where are you today? Are you in Ann Arbor? I'm in Ann Arbor uh, at home. I, I commute to uh, to my work with bringing theory to practice, but I've been doing it here, sheltering in place at home in Ann Arbor for the last six weeks. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Well, for the few people who are um, unfortunate enough to not know bringing theory to practice, uh, what's, can you give us a, a, a quick sketch of, of what this wonderful group works on? Sure, I will do. We are a, a national higher ed initiative, now more than 15 years old, although I've just served as director for the past two years, and we are committed to uh, innovation and creative change in undergraduate education but change guided by what we think of as the foundational purposes of higher education, democratic engagement, mm. uh, active and integrative learning, the well-being of the whole student, and an, a, a commitment to those purposes for all students. So I like to think of us as radical in both senses, foundational and committed to transformational change. And uh, what started this? What's what's the uh, what's the home base of of BTTOP? Are, are you a rogue entity, or are you part of some other larger enterprise? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, we have been uh, uh, hosted in partnership with the Association of American Colleges and Universities. We're actually about to move to a campus. This will be publicly announced next month, but but. Uh, our, our, our swarm can get advanced notice that we'll be moving to uh, Elon University, a place Ooh. that we really admire, uh, because we want it to be on campus and have closer connections with. Uh, you were describing your uh, surprise announcement about uh, moving to Elon University. Congratulations. Yep. Thanks. Uh, and and uh, we're going to still keep our, our mission of being kind of a rump caucus for change. Uh, our commitment is to to be a voice for the best values in higher education and a kind of center of community organizing for educational change. That's a wonderful thing to have. Uh, how many staff do you have? We only have, uh, we've had three. Uh, we'll expand a little bit uh, in Elon, but we are really see ourselves as the hub of a community of practice over the years We've worked with about 350 different campuses. Uh, so we, we see ourselves as a, a builder of a community for change. And we work with, with colleagues uh, in academic institutions from all sectors all over the country. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, if uh, friends, if you don't, if this is your introduction to bring your theory to practice, uh, if you look on the bottom of your screen, uh, here, let me just uh, change the view a little bit. You should be able to, uh, see a little button uh, on the bottom left that will let you uh, click in and uh, click to the uh, Bring Theory to Practice webpage where you can learn an awful lot because they share a great deal of content on their site for which uh, we thank you. Um, so I, I have all kinds of questions to ask you and and the theme for this week, uh, we're continuing our exploration of what the coronavirus pandemic means for higher education. And I, I'm curious if if you could take a step back and look at the biggest picture, you know, the kind of grand strategy of, of higher education. How, first of all, how has it changed us? And then I want to ask you about where you think we could go. 
Well, I thank you for that, Brian. I, I think I really like the way you posed the question, what does the pandemic mean for higher education? Because I think it's a mistake to say it by itself is changing higher education. Uh, I, I think as we look backwards, and I'm, I'm far from the first to say this, uh, we can see that the pandemic is, uh, is illuminating and amplifying some of the strengths and also some of the crises in higher education. Right. Uh, positive side, uh, it's really remarkable uh, that uh, the faculty, the national faculty and, and academic institutions made the switch to remote teaching uh, as quickly and nimbly as, as it did. And, and although I, you know, that remote teaching is not the perfect plan B, it's a sign of how uh, creative and responsive and committed to students higher ed is. I think it puts the lie to the old uh, canard that 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 academics and academic institutions are are um, incapable of responding to change. True. On the negative side, on the crisis side, it's exposed and amplified some of our important failures. Uh, it's uh, we we've had a lot of important reporting on the way it increases inequality and inequity uh, between um, haves and have nots in the student bodies and among institutions. We know that it, it's making under-resourced institutions even more precarious. Um, it's increased the problem of lack of completion uh, and attainment. Uh, so it's it, uh, the, the, the pandemic has taken problems we kind of knew we had and amplified them to, to crisis levels. Uh, and I think one of the implications of that is we shouldn't think of the crisis management that we now have to do and that institutions are doing really remarkably as laying the blueprint for change. Uh, it, we, when, the, when the house is burning, you need the skills of firefighters to put it out. Uh, and you may need people to help build temporary structures for the people who are burned out of their home, but that's different from what it takes to rebuild the house. Uh, and we're gonna need to step back, I think, from the immediate solutions to, uh, to crisis management and not say how is the pandemic changing us, but rather how do we respond with our values to the pandemic to guide the changes that it's exposing that we need. Uh, and just to give you one last teaser to that, Please. although remote teaching and, and online teaching has been an important response, it, to my mind, this is not primarily about should higher education go remote. Uh, it's about what values and practices we want, no matter what the mix of face-to-face -face and remote learning that we do. Uh, okay, I, I, there's so much to unpack in that great statement. Um, before I before I dive in, let me just invite everybody. Um, please uh, share your questions or your thoughts. Uh, if you have examples of the kinds of values that uh, that David just uh, suggested, uh, if you have stories about your campus um, spinning to try and engage with this and looking ahead, uh, if you have uh, questions about each of these different points. Starting now is the time when you can ask. So again, just either click that raised hand if you want to join us up here on stage. Perhaps one of my cats will return to me just to join you as well. Um, or if you'd rather just type in the uh, the uh, uh, Q&A box, just type that uh, and I'll flash your question up on stage. Um, one quick question uh, uh, along the way from what you just brilliantly described. Um, how does How is the coronavirus pandemic showing our illuminating our problems with degree completion. Uh, I mean, are you thinking that that this fall it's gonna be even harder for some students to return to campus and it'll accelerate our, our, our uh, what's the expression? Uh, some college no degree problem? Yes, uh, I mean, I think that, that's uh, undoubtedly gonna be true. You know, we, we know how urgent and important improving college attainment and completion has been over the past 10, 20 years, uh, the pandemic, the threats to, to campuses and to face-to-face -to -face learning are, are threats to the conditions that do the most to encourage completion, especially for underserved and historically underrepresented 
students. Uh, it makes it harder to have supportive communities, kind of three-dimensional wraparound communities of learning and practice that we know enable all students to succeed. Uh, it makes it harder for students to gain access to so-called high impact practices yes. that, that increase completion. So yes, it's, it's gonna take a problem that we had and unless we are really intentional and creative, it's gonna make it harder for more and more students to complete, especially students who lack the resources for easy connectivity or for um, close ties to their college communities. I see, and the coronavirus is gonna make those resources even harder to obtain depending on things like um, you know, multiple people competing for the same thin strand of bandwidth or um, people losing their jobs and uh, being ill. Uh, we had a, a question from one awesome, awesome uh, fellow who can participate today live, but managed to tweet out a quick uh, comment. Uh, Kelvin Bentley, um, who has the awesome, awesome uh, handle of Black Time Lord, um, says, I wonder if... <laughs> I wonder if the weaknesses have been hidden in plain sight. So many schools continue to treat online education as a bolt-on to their approach to serving residential students instead of innovating the entire model to better serve all students. Um, I wonder what, if you want to uh, Go ahead, sorry, I, I interrupted you. No, no, I, I wonder if you'd like to respond to that, please. So I think it's absolutely true that these problems have hidden in plain sight. Um, uh, and I think uh, the, the questioner's comment about, um, about being intentional and designing online learning the best uh, is true, but uh, I have a couple different thoughts about that. Um, one is that um, it's clear that, as many people have said, that remote instruction that we've had to do kind of so-called Zoom you is not online learning at its best, although it's improvisation under emergency at its best. That, that being said, um, I would say that even so far, the median good online learning experience is nowhere near as good as the median good face-to-face -face learning experience. And that we, although there are real uh, models of excellence, we haven't really fully figured out how to create the kinds of intimate, relational, supportive teaching and learning relationships that I think are, are the key to all different kinds of learning, not just so-called liberal arts uh, learning. Um, and that when we do that online, the, uh, the online medium is great for all kinds of things, for flexibility of time and space, for certain kinds of collaboration. But it, what it is not good at is providing quality at scale any more than face-to-face uh, -face can. So I, I, I think we need to be as creative as possible with online, but without the idea that mass screen-based learning um, can happen in a way that makes it uh, much cheaper. Um, online can help us conquer time and space. It doesn't fundamentally change the investments we need to need to make in, in great education. Either the financial or the personal investments. Um, that's a great answer. Um, and uh, Kelvin said he can't join us this week, but will next time. And uh, Kelvin, I'll, I'll share the recording with you so you can um, get a sense of that. Thank you for that superb answer. Uh, and friends, if you're if you're new to the forum, um, you see this is this is how we work. Uh, we're all about con being able to have these kind of conversations occur. Uh, we have another question that's come up from uh, a great friend of the program, from Tom Hames, uh, who is uh, coming to us from Texas. Um, and uh, he has, uh, in his blue room, um, and he has a question uh, about quality and how to preserve quality with these uh, incredible constraints. Tom, hey, Tom. Hi. Um, so, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Uh, well, you kind of already answered two thirds of my question just now as, as I was, uh, I was in the transporter beam. Um, but, uh, the, you know, the, the question of, uh, I teach at a community college. And so, you know, the discrepancies that, you know, you see in terms of economics, uh, you know, we do teach that 20, that bottom 20%. Uh, in many ways, economically, as well as learning skills. And so it's like the same um, 
uh, it's like doubling down because you get this distribution of of less skilled learners as well as those who are struggling technologically on top of it. I've got students taking my class on a phone right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to do things like web authoring and stuff like that. And they just, whoa, you know. <laughs> and so my question is, and you kind of circle around that, but I mean, how can we square this circle? I mean, what are some ideas for um, creating more richer environments that can scale both in person and online on the fly? Because, you know, Brian put up a thing, um, with his scenarios a couple of weeks ago, the toggle term, you know, where we could be going online, going off, coming on, depending on ebb and flow of the virus. Uh, and so how do we, how do we square that in terms of both, you know, maintaining that quality of education uh, at the same time as uh, um, reaching out those, as maintaining the equality and the quality at the same time, given the constraints. I, uh, Brian, should I take a stab at it? Absolutely. That's who, <laughs> Hello? That's who we aimed the questions at. You. It was for David. I could bug Brian otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Please, David, go ahead. Brian, uh, can you hear me? You're frozen in my screen. I'm doing okay? You're doing fine. So uh, I have a couple of thoughts about Tom's question, uh, and thank you for it. Um, let me start by saying I was uh, for several years a dean of, uh, at the new school of a division which had an adult bachelor's program that offered both online and face-to-face -face and, and hybrid uh, degrees. Uh, and I really respect uh, and watched the kind of gifted teachers who made online learning work. Um, uh, I don't think it's that you can do it on the fly to answer your question. It's going to take uh, a lot of ongoing skill building and exp creative experimentation with online platforms uh, to uh, to make it work. Um, I think the key, I, I, I've already stressed that I think really great online learning um, happens in small scale with, with small sections. Um, I don't think there are economies of scale to great online learning. It has to be very relational and very uh, collaborative. Um, and we have to be mindful that, um, that we know that students are skeptical of it. When they like online, it's for the, the ease and the flexibility of it. But pedagogically, nearly all the surveys and responses we get are that online is a less preferable, uh, less rich mode of learning. And if we want students to kind of own their education, which is one of the absolute keys to great education, uh, we need to acknowledge that and change it. We also know that, uh, that low income students, students of color, first gen students, students with fewer resources, um, tend not to do as well in the online medium. Uh, as other students, and that we can't let whatever degree of online learning uh, we need exacerbate the inequalities that are that are built into uh, to our system. So I, I think again, we need to bring the the point isn't do we go to online or not, but whatever mix of teaching and learning we need to do, whatever modality we use we need to bring our commitment to holistic and equitable and inclusive education. So how do we start building our way toward it so we don't have a train wreck in the fall? Hmm. Hmm. Well, uh, again, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think the solution for the fall should be taken as the template for what education look, should look like three to four years from now. Um, I don't think we know what this pandemic or a next pandemic uh, will bring, and we shouldn't assume that the pandemic is the condition of higher education. Here, I think the example of World War II and the GI Bill is, is really instructive. You know, in 1948, 49, hundreds of campuses had to quickly construct Quonset huts for GIs to, to enter the college class. There was a lot of mm -hmm. improvisation uh, 
that succeeded really well, but it didn't mean that Quonset huts were the new dorms for, uh, for online and uh, for, for the future of higher ed. Uh, we're gonna need to build online Quonset huts and it's not clear yet what we'll need to do in the longer run. Uh, we'll need to experiment uh, uh, with that. Um, but my guess is that um, there will be a mix of more online, I hope the best online, with hybrid and face-to-face -face, uh, classes. And um, the, the deeper question is what practices and values cut across all of those? And can we use this moment of change to do better than we have done around these issues? Yeah. Great question. Well, crisis, crisis can either breed innovation or retrenchment. Hopefully it breeds innovation. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, Tom is someone who uh, works in that innovation very, very well. Um, and thank you, David, for, uh, for the great answer. We have a couple of questions that build on this, uh, and these are text questions, so let me uh, quickly uh, flash them on the screen. There's one from uh, our longtime friend Mark Rush at Washington Lee University, who says that uh, education will never be cheap, but online does make it more accessible. How can we overcome the damage done to online by the incessant criticism from so many educators in the last decade? So I think the, the first two sentences capture the reality perfectly. It's mm -hmm. not gonna be cheap. It can make it more uh, accessible. Uh, and I guess I would um, give a friendly pushback to, uh, to the second part of Mark's question in the sense that I, I think that, yes, it's true that, that uh, faculty are often resistant to, uh, to online, although in my experience uh, as a dean, less resistant when they are given the chance to do it creatively and collaboratively, uh, and when it's not seen as a, uh, as a kind of instrumental, cheaper version of, of their teaching. But I actually think the biggest uh, barrier to overcome uh, which is one we need to respect, is the resistance and, and skepticism of students. They report back to us that their experience is too often not a rich one. And I think we need to take their response, not faculty, uh, not either faculty cheerleaders or faculty skeptics, as the thing we most have to meet. Well, thank you. That's a that's a terrific answer, and and Mark, uh, that's a great question. Uh, friends, if you're new to the uh, forum, uh, that's an example of these uh, text questions that you can enter, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of them have come in. And again, so uh, please uh, feel free to feel free to click either the raised hand or the or the question mark. Uh, this is a question from a, a near colleague of mine, uh, John Stites at Georgetown, um, and uh, John asks: Given the pandemic has created a deep financial crater in higher ed with some schools facing existential crisis. How receptive will institutions be to constructive change? <laughs> that's, that's such a good question, uh, and, I'm, and, uh, uh, and a tough one. Uh, I think, I guess I have two hopeful thoughts uh, about it. One is that the sheer degree of precariousness that we're all dealing with will will get uh, institutions and uh, staff and faculty colleagues out of a kind of kind of crouched in defensive resistance to to trying new things. Um, but the other is that um, we need to include student student voice, faculty voice, uh, include everyone in this kind of co-creation of a new system, and and emphasize the opportunity for creative change. Um, I, don't, I don't know anyone who doesn't believe that higher ed uh, needs to invite creative change and to fight against negative change. Change is, uh, is happening one way or another. And if we can get people to enlist in the possibility of their own creativity affecting the outcome, then maybe there will be uh, an alternative to a kind of um, fight or flight reaction. Very democratic vision, a lowercase d, uh, including everybody, students, 
uh, staff as, as well as faculty. Um, thank you. That's a, John, it's a great question. And, uh, and Dave, that's the most heartening answer I've heard uh, about it um, so far. We have uh, um, uh, a question aimed at me, actually, uh, from uh, Kenan Salonero. Uh, and I, I want to share this because it's a great observation. Uh, Kenan asks if I'm familiar with Howard Rheingold's virtual courses out of Stanford in the Connected Learning Alliance. And the answer is yes. Howard's a longtime dear friend of mine, a fantastic writer, a great thinker, did brave stuff at Stanford and Berkeley, and uh, definitely someone I want to bring back on the program when we can. Um, and the Collective Learning Alliance is very, very useful. Um, we have a, a, a question that asks us to look a little further ahead. Um, this comes from uh, Jessica Sullivan at NYU. Uh, and she asks, if we can envision what campus life from the university will look like in the fall, especially for seniors, and I, I don't know, Jessica, if you mean academic seniors or people over 65. Could campus life support social distancing needs that may be as critical as life now without a vaccine? Uh, um, Brian, I, um, that's a great question. And I feel as if uh, I am no more qualified to answer it than, than Jessica or you. Uh, I, I've been listening to institutional leaders like Christine Paxson at Brown University who just called in, in an influential op-ed for reopening Brown and other institutions right. mm -hmm. and started to describe some of the nuts and bolts of how that could, uh, how that could work. Um, but honestly, I'm, I'm as much a, a kind of rank and file, you know, uh, follower of that conversation than someone who has special insight uh, in it. Um, I guess I would just add um, two very personal comments. One is to reinforce what I just said about student voice. I, I think students need to be key co-creators of these uh, solutions, uh, both because they will have really important ideas and because they need to sign on to the regime of, of testing, of social distancing, of whatever. Uh, it is. And the second is to note Jessica's comment about seniors. My youngest son is a 22-year-old uh, college senior in the next room as we speak uh, who's had to lose his senior spring. Uh, and it's, it's really, it, it's a very small heartbreak against the really large tragedies of the pandemic, but it's a heartbreak. Uh, and I think uh, it's only increased my sense of the hunger that people have for physical community as part of their educational process. I hear that. I hear that. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, this is a kind of, if I can get literary critical for a second, this is a moment of defamiliarization uh, where what we expected, what we're accustomed to, has now been thrown into sharp relief. And yeah. you can see it very, very clearly. Uh, just as a side note, um, uh, Mark responds, uh, that several of his students have expressed relief from the pressures of the ongoing social pressure cooker. So it's a it's a flip side. Is this is kind yeah. of the, the introvert's delight, and uh, um, as a as a card carrying extrovert, I, I, I find this uh, absolutely terrifying. Um, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I, I, if if I could, if I could come back to uh, to Jessica's great question, and Jessica, if if you want to follow that up uh, by uh, my question about seniors. Um, uh, I can be pretty um, pedantic about these things, I'm afraid. Um, I, I wonder if, um, you know, to what extent we try to apply the liberal arts approach, liberal education approach, to the overall spectrum of, of higher education. That is, you know, do we do we think about um, this intensive connection between instructor and student? Do we apply the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary nature of inquiry? Um, you know, do we manage to expand that across higher education? Does that not become more desirable if we think that remote instruction is of a lower quality? Uh, if you're pitching that to me, I've got some thoughts about that. I, I am indeed. And anybody else who wants to chime in, please, please feel free. You can tell we're not shy. So my vision of liberal education as opposed to liberal arts education mm -hmm. is uh, that it's, it, that it's, um, integrated with practical skill building that in which uh, students learn the kind of work they want to do uh, 
and is, is represents a kind of teaching and learning that ought to be present in, in all institutions and in all sectors with all schools and divisions and all courses of study. So you might think of me as being as kind of a, uh, a, a sort of preacher for the integration of liberal learning and practical uh, learning, uh, learning by, by doing, uh, um, I, I cut my teeth for the last 20 years on community engaged and community partnership yeah. work. So I'm a passionate, uh, believer uh, in the, these values uh, being part of what informs all really uh, great education. And I would say that, that uh, especially in uh, the, the part of that that has to do with bringing your learning to the world and your world to, to learning, whether that's profession, pre-professional or mm -hmm. community-based, um, rich relationships, peer relationships, mentoring relationships, all the things that represent the sinews of that kind of education are, if anything, even more important than the humanities seminar kind of learning. Well, thank you. That's uh, I appreciate that glimpse into your uh, into your thinking uh, and your model of what uh, what this can look like um, and what liberal education can look like uh, in that kind of integrated fashion. Um, I, I have more questions, but better than me, we have the audience was full of questions. Uh, right. We have one from uh, Shandell Holden, uh, who's at Royal Roads, a postdoctoral fellow, who asks, to what degree do you think we can include broader community voices in the democratic vision of the evolution of higher education? I, how I mean, we center both student voices as well as community needs? Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I just want to say, amen, testify, that is exactly right. Uh, and, um, and, I, and I think the, the question, uh, Shannon's, linking of student voice and community voice, if we believe that it's part of the mission of higher education to foster democratic, civic, and community life, which I do, I see that as a, a core purpose uh, of our work, then the communities with which we work, not only for which we work, uh, need to be part of that dialogue about what good education uh, needs to be. Uh, and I and I, I that has always been true, but I would say to bring it back to bring it back to the pandemic, um, uh, it's really important to, it, to, in my view, to see the pandemic not as a standalone event, but as an episode in what's now going to be a period of recurring crisis. Uh, the the Great Recession was part of that. Yeah. The, this won't be the last pandemic, and of course, climate change is in some ways the mm -hmm. the largest scale crisis and it's really important that we that we ask ourselves what should education look like under conditions of crisis and educating students to be agents of of solutions and the communities that are affected by these different crises are absolutely key partners in answering that question so we shouldn't just see this as one thing that's uh, um, that's occurring one a one-off um, but that uh, higher education is uh, in, engaged in grappling with a whole series of crises. Um, that's, a, that's a powerful vision that, um, and a kind of daunting one that puts us in a, a kind of a perpetual emergency management mode. Well, let me, let me um, say I hope that's not the outcome because I, it, it seems to me if what I've said has some truth to it as a, as a look back and a look forward, it's really important for us to not simply reel from one reactive reaction to emergency to the other, but to say, what is our mission to bring research to bear, to bring undergraduate education to bear on, on an era of crisis in which we can expect this thing we're reacting to not to be the last uh, one? How do we want students to be empowered to be agents of problem solving? How should it change our, uh, our research agenda and our teaching agenda? And here again, I would go back to the World War II moment when not only did the GI Bill expand access to higher education, uh, but the Truman Commission and um, the Commission on Research took that moment of crisis and risk and said, 
this is the opportunity where we, uh, and, and the necessity of enlarging our vision of what a democratic and, and expert uh, higher ed system can bring. We need a new moment like that. Mm. Mm. Maybe even a Marshall Plan for, uh, for education, yeah. if I can continue that. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, and Shandell, um, thank you very much for that uh, fantastic question. True, true. We have more questions piling in, and uh, I, I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to, uh, to to look at them. We have one from Vasudeva Rao Aravind uh, from Clarion, uh, a professor there, uh, and asks, how do you think incoming freshman enrollment will be affected this fall, especially at regional and rural institutions where many students are unfamiliar and uncomfortable with learning online? That is a great question to which I don't know the answer. I, I imagine that Brian and many in this uh, in this swarm who are both more are more immersed uh, online teachers and maybe teach at rural institutions could answer that. But I think it's it's really key. The one thing I would say is we won't find solutions institution by institution atomistically that one of the things that we need to do is to pool expertise and resources across institutions and across sectors. So maybe one of the answers will be regional clusters that are working together to find solutions. Well, that's a good point. I, I really, really hope so. I, I really hope we can be that uh, the collaborative. In uh, Canada, Alex Usher is uh, working to uh, produce a kind of inter-university, inter-provincial um, uh, education resource uh, which uh, sounds fantastic uh, if you can get that going. Um, and uh, for everybody else, if you are at or if you are knowledgeable of uh, rural institutions or regional institutions, please chime in. I'll be glad just to share your observations and reflections. Either you know, click the raised hand to join us on stage or type it in the uh, chat and we'll, we'll bring that up. Um, Jessica is uh, absolutely on fire. Uh, Jessica Sullivan has uh, even more questions and she draws us to uh, the biggest sector of American higher education to ask what will happen to community colleges as we discuss costs and access to affordable education? Are they in line for stimulus money? And can we ask institutions of means to adopt a community college? Wow, great thinking. Yes, this is this may be, you know, the, the in, in terms of sector, the most important question we've asked because community colleges are key to uh, educating displaced and, and unemployed workers to uh, being key institutions in communities that are facing economic uh, crisis, but they're themselves the least resourced, the most under-resourced sector. So we, we absolutely need to fight not only in the stimulus, but in state budgets and in federal support for expanded support for community colleges. And I'm not sure I would use the word adoption because that implies a kind of parental relationship that that we that that isn't the best metaphor. But partnering across sectors between the four-year sectors and community colleges, maybe not not simply in um, twinning relationships with a single public institution, but with regional clusters, I think uh, would be really really uh, important. And I know from my own learning that community colleges often have important solutions to teach the four-year sector, not just the other way around. Definitely. Um, and that's, uh, again, Jessica, that's a fantastic question, and what a vision. Um, and uh, David, I, I really I love the idea of the regional clusters as a, another response to this. Um, we have uh, more questions, one from uh, SUNY, speaking of regional institutions. Um, and this is Carl S. Uh, who um, asks to think, how do you feel about the difference between online education being provided in middle and upper school as opposed to how it is provided in higher education? And is it time to create synergy between them? So I, um, I, that's, a, that's one of those questions in which I'm a kind of bystander watching and learning. Uh, I confess that I, I put so much emphasis in terms of good teaching and learning, good education, on building thick communities of inquiry and communities of practice, uh, on the importance of peer relationships, student to student, as well as mentoring relationships. 
it can be done really effectively online, but it's harder to do it. And my, my suspicion is that it's even harder for high school age students than for college students. I'm happy to be proven wrong on this, but um, I don't look on online secondary education intuitively as a, as a good solution to improving secondary education. I think the question of rural students is, is a different one because of the need to have uh, spatial and, and geographic flexibility. But in general, I start out skeptical about that. Well, that's a good answer. Uh, and Carl, thank you for this question. If you want to follow up again, uh, please feel free. You can uh, flip your camera on. We'd be glad to have you on stage. Um, Jessica um, Sullivan answers my question very generously by saying that seniors, she meant uh, in terms of academic rank. Um, I mentioned her own niece will be a senior at Loyola U Chicago. I'm sorry that her experience is not good, Jessica. Um, hope they can do better than that, and, and they really should. Um, we have, uh, friends, we're in the last eight or nine minutes, which is crazy to think about since it feels to me like we just started getting in. Uh, and we have more comments and questions that have, uh, that have come in. I do want to share another one from Kenan uh, Salonero, uh, who asks us, who gives rise to some other things to look at, namely um, EDX, uh, McGill University Grook, which I actually don't know, uh, EDX's ULAB, or the Pacamama Alliance. Um, David, a lot of these are new to me, actually. Uh, Kenan, if you want to join us in, uh, on stage or just type in more about information about them, I'd love to learn more. Uh, are these new to you, or do you have, uh, are these experiments that we should be paying attention to that you know of? Um, I know, I, I know uh, a bit about edX and edX's ULAB, um, but I don't know the other ones. I'm assuming a group is a first cousin to a MOOC, but I'm not sure. I guess. I guess. Um, so, Kenan, thank you for drawing our attention to those. Uh, it's really, really important to see. Um, and I, David, I, I have a question for myself and while everybody else is, uh, um, is, is churning away and, and throwing questions and, and, and popping these other. Um, it, it seems like we are, we are in, a, in a very tactical mode. Uh, people are wondering how best to teach with uh, video. People are wondering about how the LMS works. How do you reach rural students and which bandwidth? And these are all very vital operational questions. But I'm wondering how, how you can help us all think in a more strategic way. Um, I mean, Tom was inviting us to reimagine, to deconstruct and reconstruct higher education. How can we find the intellectual space to do that when so many face themselves, see themselves in a moment of existential crisis. That, that is a great question. And, and I really appreciate the way you, you framed it. I think it's right now we are in the middle of tactical and operational problem solving and that's necessary uh, and it's totally honorable. Um, and we're gonna muddle through uh, um, those folks who know about uh, uh, Winnicott's idea of the good enough mother as an as an important model in in child psychology that we we should not try to be the perfect parent we should try to be the good enough parent. Um, I think right now we have to be the good enough teachers in the face uh, of of this. But at the same and 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 I'm not sure. In fact, I I tend to suspect that this is the wrong time to think we know what the long term solutions will be. So I, in some of my conversations with people, when they've said, next week, let's convene a redesign uh, conversation, my reaction is, this is actually a terrible time to make choices that will uh, determine design change two years from now, because we're still working through the operational crisis. But I think we do need to create space for exactly these kinds of conversations. The the, the op-ed pieces in Inside Higher Ed or the Chronicle that I've appreciated most, um, I'm thinking of, uh, of one uh, recently by, um, I think his name is Jeff Hanstead, I don't, I don't know him, but who was saying, this is a really important opportunity for um, or reorganizing curricula around helping students confront big, wicked interdisciplinary problems. He didn't have a plan for how to do that but connecting the pandemic to the teaching of wicked problems 
gave me kind of intellectual space to be to be thinking uh, uh, about that. Um, but I think I think we need a combination of slow and fast. That simply being fast and nimble in response to the operational challenges should not crowd out being slower about the issues of what constitutes great teaching and learning in, in a period of crisis. You know, and the same thing's happening in medicine. We need, everyone's talking about how to shift to telehealth and there are big operational questions yeah. involved in that. But those questions are different from what does it mean to be a great doctor or to, uh, to answer a deep question about, uh, about the development of new medications which will be then delivered through telehealth uh, in new ways. We can't let the operational instrumental questions create so much noise that we don't have space to think about the values that we bring to it. We don't, we don't want to be data driven. We want to be values driven and informed by data. That's a great phrase. That's a gr great phrasing and a great distinction to make. Um, thank you. Uh, that's, that's a lot to go on. Uh, she did ask a question that um, I can uh, share on the screen, um, which is about uh, current federal policy. Is our government doing anything now, like the previous GI Bill for Education? There will be so many inconsistencies due to inequities. That is, a, that is a great question, and I have a quick answer to it. But before I do, let me invite anyone, Jessica and other people who had questions they wanted to ask, to feel free to be in touch with me by email and, and continue these conversations. Um, that's at scoby at bt2p.org. Um, there's beginning to be a conversation, to go back to Jessica's question, um, I posted about this in Facebook, and but there are many other people doing it, um, talking about either extending GI Bill uh, benefits or creating new benefits for all frontline so-called essential workers. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best of these conversations involves not only healthcare workers who deserve this, but the grocery stockers, the sanitation people, the food delivery folks, everyone who is has both the economic need but also is doing the civic work of, yeah. of, keep, of enabling all of us to survive. Uh, and it, it, yesterday, I'm, I live here in Michigan, the governor just proposed uh, a new policy of free tuition for all essential workers uh, in all of those different categories. Oh, wow. um, so I think uh, we're at the beginning of a, of a really important conversation that all of us can be and should be policy advocates for. Yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a breathtaking vision. And that's another way that we can think about this in terms of the macro issues. I just really hope that we uh, have the uh, political and financial wherewithal to uh, actually do that. Um, but David, we can do this best, I think, with, with your help and your guidance. Thank you so much for, for being such a fantastic, fantastic guest. And friends, you can see why I was so eager to have David on the program. Um, I mean, this uh, I, I have all kinds of, uh, of, of uh, questions. Oh, but before I go further, uh, William Emerson shared a link. Let me just put this up on the screen for people to see. Uh, this is Governor Whitmer in Michigan, uh, her policy suggestion. Uh, so there's... Uh, you can copy and paste that, and uh, I'll share that actually out with the uh, uh, on Twitter to make sure everyone can see that. Thanks uh, for sharing that. Uh, really appreciate that and doing that so quickly. Um, I, I put on the on the screen on the bottom left. You can see it. They bring theory to practice uh, homepage, so people can click there. And I, I presume they'll probably take down the site with a huge rush of people clicking at the same time. Um, you you mentioned that you would love to email people and hear from them. Can you repeat your email address so people can bug you? Sure. Uh, SCOBY, S-C-O-B as in boy, E-Y, at B-T-T-O-P dot org. Okay. Uh, and sorry, go ahead, Brian. No, I was gonna, there you go. And I, I can say from experience that uh, um, there's a, he's a wonderful correspondent who answers much more quickly than I do, I'm afraid. <laughs> and, 
in, the, in, the, in our discussion, uh, Mercedes Yonora uh, from, uh, from your organization said, people can sign up for our mailing list. It goes out every two weeks. And I think they can get that from the website, right? Yes, thank you, Mercedes. Uh, um, we call that biweekly newsletter, Bringing It, and we would love to have you uh, be, be on our mailing list. We know how, Brian, I wanted to say you are such an important convener and thought partner. So your commu this community of, of thinkers, we wanna join our community of thinkers. Oh, I would love that. I think that's a, a consummation devoutly to be wished. Um, Thank you, thank you very much for the kind words, and I, and those kind words apply more to this great audience, formerly known as the audience of participants, with their wonderful perspectives and great questions. Um, we're at the end of the hour, so I, I need to regretfully and sadly bid you adieu. Please enjoy as much of Ann Arbor for me as you can, David. But but everybody, don't leave yet because I've got a news for uh, the next um, week of uh, events. Uh, first of all, if you'd like to continue exploring this topic. Uh, next, tomorrow, actually, um, uh, I'm, my partnership with the Chronicle Higher Education means we're going to be doing a session on inclusive teaching in the online classroom. Uh, so you can find out more about that from that link. Just go to tinyurl.com slash chronicle 4-31. That's the date. Uh, and you can learn more. I'd be glad to see you there. I'll be co-hosting and co-moderating that. Now, next week, uh, we will continue our focus on uh, what the pandemic means for higher education. I hope we can all bring uh, our scobyized minds to this, thinking about how we can best rethink, deconstruct, and reconstruct higher education in the middle of this uh, epic crisis, but not the only crisis. Uh, if you'd like to continue talking about this, we have many, many venues for it. Uh, Twitter seems to be the most popular, so just use the hashtag FTTE, or you can tweet at me. Uh, but also we have our groups on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and Slack. Uh, and if you'd like to go back in time and, and look at almost five years of programs, um, please look at our archive. Uh, we now have 191 recordings there. Uh, this may be unprecedented. Um, and it's a lot of great, great conversation starring most of you. Um, in the meantime, uh, please, friends, thank you all, first of all, for these great thoughts and conversations. Uh, I really admire uh, your ability, all of you, to think collectively on this. And second, please stay safe. Don't infect anybody. You know the drill. Wash your hands, wear a mask, and take care of yourself. And otherwise, we'll see you next week, and we'll see you online. Thanks. Bye-bye.